Okay, hi everybody. My name's uh, Jafar Hussain. I'm uh, here to talk to you about a uh, framework that we've developed here at Netflix called Falcor. So I'm going to start off by pointing out what you guys as web developers mostly know, which is that every user out there wants to believe that all the data out there on the cloud is sitting right there on their device, right? What if we could code that way, though? What if we could code as if all the data out there on the network were just sitting there on the device waiting to access, just like an in-memory JSON object? So let's talk about REST. How many people out there, I'm just curious, have what they would consider a REST service layer, a RESTful service layer, or access a RESTful, RESTful service layer? Interesting, okay. So REST is certainly something that came out of the World Wide Web, right? It was, it was the ideas that were extracted from what worked on the World Wide Web. And what is the World Wide Web? Well, we've got a graph of resources, right? Every resource has a unique identifier. That's what you go visit in your browser. And finally, we have verbs for transforming those resources. Get, post, put. Now, we at Netflix, we're taking a look at how to build a brand new service layer three years ago. And we said, you know what? Netflix is a browsing problem. Why don't we just build our service layer in the image of the World Wide Web and build ourselves a nice RESTful API? And this is sort of what our RESTful API started out with, right? We've got resources that are accessible by, your, by URLs. They've got the ID embedded in there. But a funny thing happened over time. And I'm curious how many people out there have had the same thing happen with them. Um, that RESTful API didn't, get look, didn't look so clean after a while. So here's what it started out as. Here we've got our title resource, a little JSON object available at this particular URL, right? So that's just one resource in perhaps a whole list of titles that you see when you open up the Netflix. Now, one of the problems we had with REST was latency. Now imagine if every single time you opened up Netflix, we had to make something like 30 calls to the server. First, one to get all of those resources to find out which resources to display to you. Then when we had to go each individual HTTP request to get each individual JSON piece for a title. And then we had to go to the CDN and get the image and so on and so forth. And I think it probably just finished loading there. And it's about, that's about how long it took in real life, too. It took a really, really long time. And that's the odd thing. When we built what we considered a, a principled RESTful API, all of a sudden it, it seemed that we'd, latency was a big problem for us. So. Really what happened? Why is it that maybe REST isn't the ideal type of distributed architecture for a lot of web apps out there? Well, it's that maybe 10 years ago, the web was a place to go get things. And today it's something very different. It's still a place to get things, but increasingly it's a place to do things. We've transitioned from using web pages to web applications. And the interesting thing about this contrast is that web pages tend to serve small amounts of large resources, right? You open up the New York Times, you might see a few images, but mostly just articles with large amount of text on them. But web apps tend to serve large amounts of small resources. So when you open up Netflix on your iPad and swipe, boy, really what you're seeing is hundreds of small resources fly by on the screen. And that's absolutely typical for web applications where you're doing large amounts of browsing. So over time, Netflix's RESTful API kind of became a little different. It, uh, it turned into what we, we affectionately referred to as a uh, RESTless API. We sort of, you know, we started adding a bunch of query string parameters because, well, some platforms like the iPad wanted fewer fields when they displayed detail pages, but some other platforms wanted different fields, and we kept adding these URL parameters until by the time we were done, we took a look at this thing and we were like, you know what, these are just procedures. This is just RPC. We're basically using a URL, not as a resource, but as a way of invoking some procedure out there and giving us back data. How many people in the room, I'm just curious, feel like you're maybe in this category a little bit, where you're passing a lot of URL? Yeah, you don't say. And there's a drawback to that. Now, a lot of us as developers, we're comfortable with calling procedures, right? We know procedures, we understand procedures. But there's a benefit to doing things in the principled RESTful way, and I'll come back to that in a second. But one of the great things about RPC right, is that we get to make one call and do exactly what we need to do for an individual view. And you'll find that what happens over time is each individual view, at least when in our architecture, ended up with its own very customized RPC. And so what was great about that is one request would get us all the data we needed to display something on screen, right? That's what we were trying to get away from, the latency of REST. But what we found is we had all of these different procedures now coupled to the view. Every single time we wanted to change a view, we had to go to the RPC, the endpoint that it hit, and change that to now download that extra field we wanted to display, and so on and so forth. And the other problem with RPC, and this is where it really falls down, is you don't get cache consistency. You know how your web browser works? 
where if you go to a web page and then leave and then come right back, hopefully it loads it out of cache. And this gives the impression that sort of, you know, gives, it gives that illusion to developers that I was talking about earlier, that they stop thinking about the network and just data comes to them as quickly as possible. That's the wonderful thing about caching. Well, it kind of breaks down when you have RPC, because here I have this one endpoint, which actually accesses just a piece of these resources. Just accesses maybe just the name or ID of a title, or maybe just the box shot, and maybe just gives a little information, maybe like the visible page or the personalized list of recommendations that we give you. But here we have this other endpoint which overlaps. And that's really dangerous, because what ends up happening is in your browser cache, you get the same resource stored twice. So that's the real hazard with caching. You might end up showing stale data to the user because now we have two URLs where the same data is displayed. So what we get out of REST is we have cache consistency, right? Cache, you don't even think about caching. You just have to let the browser handle it for you if you've made a proper RESTful API. And you get loose coupling. You don't sort of have to go change the server every single time you want to change your view, right? You just pull whatever data you need and then display it. With RPC, we get small message sizes, though. We can download just the data. If I'm just displaying the box shot when you load that Netflix homepage, that's all I have to display. I don't have to display that, to download that entire video resource. And finally, we get low latency. One call, and I'm done, right? I get everything I need for a particular view. We, at Netflix, we wanted the best of both of these. And that's why we developed Falcor. So Falcor is a, a um, protocol for web applications. It's designed for the needs of web applications, which display large amounts of small resources. So before I tell you what Falcor is, I'm going to tell you what it's not. It is not a database, an MVC framework, or a web server. It's not a replacement for any of these. In fact, Falcor fits into your existing stack and allows the layers to communicate more efficiently. It's what sometimes is colloquially referred to as middleware. Now, I'm going to get to some code soon. But really, here's how you conceptualize what Falcor does. Falcor allows you to take all of the data you have in the server, all of the different services. Maybe you have your data spread across multiple databases. Maybe it's available in, from a variety of microservices, and expose them as a single JSON resource on the server. So you're only ever going to one JSON object that has all the data. It could be gigabytes large, for all you know, but it has all the data your web application is ever going to need. And then Falcor allows you to act as though you have all of that data available on the device. So you access that data as if it was, we're using the same API anyways, as if it was an in-memory JSON object. And it basically handles all the network communication for you. So what is Falcor? Well, fundamentally, I want you guys to think of it as an asynchronous model. So you guys are familiar with models, and probably a lot of you are familiar with the MVC pattern or the MV star, all these different MV flavors. Well, we all know we have a model. Our application has a model, and that's the information that we want to display to the user. Here's how Falcor works. First, we take all of your data, we model it as that single JSON resource out there on the cloud, and then we basically create the illusion that all that data is available in your app. And then your app accesses your asynchronous model. The only difference between accessing this and an in-memory JSON object is that it returns you a promise. It's asynchronous. And so when you request data from this JSON model, it actually gets sent off to the server. And we use the query string to make sure that we only download from that big JSON object in the cloud exactly the piece that your view requested. And so that piece gets sent down, but it also gets cached in memory before it's delivered to your view. And then your view displays it. And then the view, let's say we click on a title here and we go to uh, the detail page for a particular title, maybe House of Cards. It requests just that data from the server, caches it, displays it. Now maybe we go to the related titles for House of Cards. Once again, the view asks the asynchronous model for information. It gets sent off to the server. We download just the piece of the model out there, display it, and we're done. Now, the great thing about the caching layer here, it's just in memory, just an in memory JSON object, is that if I hit back and we go to the previous page, well, this time we pull the data out of memory and we deliver it asynchronously again, but we do it immediately. And once again, if I decide to hit back, this time we're asking for the same data we asked for before, it works just like a web browser, but over a JSON document instead of the World Wide Web. So, what is it like to program Netflix on Falcor? Well, I'm going to. Uh, Throw caution to the wind here. I'm going to do a little bit of live coding. This is probably one of the larger audiences I've done live coding in front of. So if I screw up, you guys got to help me out and point out my syntax errors. You know, this is a team effort. So uh, first of all, we know that we, in any system, we have to have a model, right? So what's the Netflix model like? 
What is it? Well, it's basically, if you've ever used Netflix, by the way, how many of you guys are out there? Where are my Netflix users? Okay, so you guys know the model, right? You open up Netflix, you got a list of genres, and within each genre, you have a list of titles, right? So we have our genre list, and then here's an individual genre list recently watched, and then we have an array of titles, and each of those titles has an ID, a name, and a rating, and perhaps a bunch more fields. So that's our model. So let's live code a mini Netflix service layer with Falcor, shall we? Okay, wish me luck. So I've, uh, I've kicked this off here with a, exactly what we saw earlier there, recently watched, I've got Daredevil, uh, House of Cards, two great Netflix originals. And first we're just gonna go against this, like just we use normal JSON, right? If I wanna pull the name of the first genre list out, is that visible? Everybody can see that, right? Pretty straightforward, right? Let's just make sure that works. No, I already got it up here, spoiler alert. Yes, it does. So nothing too amazing here, right? We know how to use JSON, we know how to use JavaScript paths to pull items out of a JSON document. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work with the exact same JSON document, except we're gonna work with it indirectly through a Falcor model. So bear with me here. I'm gonna make a slight change. I'm going to take this JSON document and initialize it as the cache in my asynchronous Falcor model. Okay, so exactly the same JSON document you guys saw before. The only difference is now it has an asynchronous API. Well, what does that change really? Well, not much. I'm gonna take the exact same JavaScript path that I had and I'm gonna pass it to this get method and that's gonna return me a promise because it's an asynchronous API. By the way, how many people, people out there are familiar with promises? Great, most of you. Let me change this to get value and we are gonna display the name and should, we should actually see the exact same information displayed as before. So you can't tell that worked, but it did work because we are actually showing the exact same information that we are before. Okay, great. So why do we want to access our JSON through an asynchronous model? Can anybody think of a good reason to do it? Why not just access it directly in memory? What's, what's the benefit, anybody? Well, one of the great things about using an asynchronous API is that I can take that information and I can move it anywhere on the network without changing the way in which I access that information. So as we saw, I just used a JavaScript path there, but later I'm gonna show you that I can take that data and move it anywhere on the network, move it off to a node server, and in fact, move it into databases and not change my client API at all. I'm gonna use it the exact same way as I did when it was in memory, but we'll get to that in a second. So first I'm gonna show off a few of the interesting things Falcor can do. Instead of grabbing just a value, we can grab multiple values. So Falcor supports ranges, so I can grab the, not just the name of the first, of the uh, first genre list, I can grab the name of the first title in the first two genre lists. Hopefully. And what I get is a fragment of the JSON document out there in the cloud with just the information that I've requested. So as we can see, I can use ranges inside of my uh, JavaScript expressions as well. So Falcor supports ranges. And in addition to that, what if I want to get the name and rating of the first title in the first two genre lists? Well, Falcor supports multiple keys and indexers. So this time, we should see both our name and our rating. Okay, so that's pretty much the Falcor API. There's not much more to it than that. JavaScript paths that you know and love, plus, rate it, plus the ability to use ranges and multiple keys and indexers. So earlier, I promised you guys that I would show you moving that data off on the network, but I'm gonna show you one more thing first. Now, in addition to getting data, that's just half the fun, right? We wanna set data. So let's say, um, let's say I, I'm watching Netflix and I see, hey, look, I've got this great new release here, House of Cards. So I wanna watch it. And so I watch it, and then as a result, the next time I load Netflix, predictably, it's both in the recently watched and new releases, right? This highlights one of the challenges about using JSON data for our backend. I'm gonna show you one of the problems with using JSON data in just a moment. In addition to get, I can also set. So I liked it, I liked House of Cards. I thought it was great. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set the rating of House of Cards to five. I believe it should print out the rating. And then afterwards, just to prove it worked, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna grab the, uh, the rating and name of the first title in the first two genre lists.
And we'll print this out just to confirm everything worked. Okay. Great. It worked. So I set the first one. Does anybody see the problem? Anybody see the problem? Yell it out. Right. Who's experienced this problem, or at least had to deal with it before? Right? It's not so easy. What's the fundamental problem here? Well, the fundamental problem is that my domain model, like every interesting domain model, is a graph. And Jason is for modeling trees. Right? So here you have the same two titles and two different lists. And when we expand it into JSON, it gets turned into a tree and then sent over the wire. And then we attach an ID to it. Notice, this is the duplicate and identify strategy, where we take our graph, we expand it into a tree, we introduce duplicates, and then we put an ID on it so we're sure that we know when it gets to the client that it's the same title. So it goes all the way to the client, and then we hope some conscientious client-side developer has written the code to check those IDs and make sure that they dedupe it into one object. And that's how, frankly, a lot of web applications deal with the graph-to-tree problem. Well, Falcor has a different solution. Introducing JSON graph. It's a very simple way of modeling your domain model as JSON. So I'll show you. You can turn any JSON document into a JSON graph document in two easy steps. First, we're going to go through. We're going to find all of the entities in my document with IDs. I'm going to introduce a top level a top level map called titles by ID. And I'm going to organize it by the ID. So I'm going to put in 523 here. And then I am going to place House of Cards at this location, this one and only location. Now it's organized by its ID. That's the first step. The next step, I go to every single occurrence of House of Cards and I replace it with a reference. Now a reference is just a JSON object with a dollar sign type property that contains a path. And that's all there is to it. A reference, who, the, who out there is familiar with symbolic links in Unix? Maybe some folks? This is just a symbolic link, right? So and a symbolic link is a file that contains a path to another location in the Unix file system. And whenever you evaluate a symbolic link, it jumps to that other location and continues evaluating the path. Well, JSON graph works exactly the same way. It introduces this one little concept to JSON called a reference. And now if we evaluate a path, I'm going to change this. By the way, there's a little helper function for creating references, which looks a little nicer, so I'm going to pull that in right now. But it, it, all it does, there's no magic. All it does is create exactly the object you see right here. Just take some of the boilerplate out of it. Is this ref constructor. So here we go. Now we should be able to evaluate exactly the same thing we did before, and this time we'll see what happens. Now we've got only one copy of House of Cards in the entire JSON model, right? Oh, there. Help me out, guys. What did I do wrong? Thank you very much. I believe it's also falcor.model.ref. Great. Don't be shy, by the way. If you see me making a mistake, go ahead, yell it out. You're less embarrassing for me. So you'll see here, ignore this. This is just um, metadata, which ha serves a purpose and we'll talk about later. But as you can see, rating is five in both places. So better than to make a duplicate of objects and then try and dedupe them later, never make a copy. Right? Have every single entity in your JSON document stored once and only once, and then you'll never have to worry about stale data. That's how Falcor does it with JSON Graph. And so that's all there is to JSON Graph. A little bit more, but not too much more, is this simple notion of a reference. And you can place it anywhere you want in your JSON document and make sure you never end up with duplicates. So that's pretty much how JSON Graph works. But I, the big reveal that I promised you guys earlier is we were going to be able to take this data out of the browser. It's right now it's just sitting in our HTML document in memory in the browser. And we're going to move it off into the node server. So watch carefully as I just cut, 
right? No more data. This is the entire HTML file you see right here. And I'm going to go over here into my node script. So I've got a node server set up. There's not much to it. You can see the whole thing's on the screen right now, right? And I am literally going to paste this model in right here. Does everybody see that? So I've moved it from the client onto the server. And now, all I have to do to expose all of the data in this JSON graph document is, at a single JSON URL, is use this special helper function here called data source route, which is provided. I'm currently using the Express MVC server. Who's had a little experience with Express? For those of you guys that, oh, okay, great. So that's all there is to it. That's all it takes to plug in this JSON graph document I've defined up here and make it available at a single URL, model.json. By the way, I don't think I mentioned why I am exposed all this data at a single URL. It was to get around the need to make multiple requests for data. When all of your data is available at a single URL, you never need to make multiple requests to get that data. You can get all the data you want in a single HTTP request. And that's how we get around the high cost of making HTTP requests. Most browsers are limited to only certain numbers of concurrent HTTP requests. You don't have that limitation anymore with Falcor. That's why we expose all that data at a single URL. And a couple more reasons, which I'll get into in a moment. So all I'm doing is I'm taking our model and exposing it as a data source. And that's just basically an interface which we use, the data source interface. There's lots of different things that implement the data source interface. It's just an interface of one layer of indirection between you and your JSON graph data. So I'm going to go over here. Now, I've removed my model, so I can't access the data. However, all I have to do now to create, I'm going to create another model. But this time, instead of adding the data in memory in the cache, I'm going to connect this model to the one out there on the server using an HTTP data source. And all this is going to do is remote all the commands out there to our newly created model.json file. And we're going to just start simple here. And let's just grab the, uh, the name of the first genre list, shall we? All right. I'm going to open our developer tools also. Oh, OK, it worked. So as you can see, I barely changed any code there on the client. right? All I had to do was hook it up to the one on the server, and it just works. We, we access that data the same way, using the same JavaScript paths with which you're familiar, whether that data is out there on the cloud or it's local in memory. And this is great for things like mocking, right? Especially, have you guys ever had the experience of waiting for the server guys to finish up before you were could keep working? You were sort of blocked on them providing the endpoints? Not so much anymore, right? You just drop it into JSON and you keep going, right? So let's see what actually happened here under the hood. I'm going to go ahead and open up our developer tools. I want to access this one more time so it shows up in the network. Let's take a look at the HTTP request that was sent off. So we see. What you're seeing here is actually just sort of a parsed version of the JavaScript path that was in there before. It's URL encoded here, but if we go down here, we can see what was sent off. It's pretty much just what we asked for, right? Can't see? Oops. <laughs> uh, let's see. Almost. Ah, oh, I'm running out of space. Still nothing. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it, and you guys are going to trust me, all right? That's what it was there. <laughs> it's just exactly what we asked for, but in this parsed form, OK? So now I'm going to show you a couple more tricks. Now, Falcor says, you know what? Don't worry about the network access. We'll handle it for you. And Falcor has three tricks up its sleeve to make this efficient. The first one, which I mentioned already, was caching. So here I've asked for the name of the first genre list. But let's say we turn around and ask for the exact same thing all over again. So we're going to log it both times. And what we should see, right, print it out twice. Well, that's easy. But did we make, how many network requests did we make? Well, let's find out. Just one. Right? 
The second one didn't go off to the network because every single piece of this JSON object out there in the cloud that we download, we stick in an in-memory cache inside of that model. And so if you turn around and ask for the same thing, it just leaps out at the cache, even though the API is asynchronous. Got a question back there. Good, well, it doesn't any more than, for example, your web browser doesn't know, right? But the good news is we provide you a whole series of different ways of uh, invalidating cache data when it becomes uh, out of, when it becomes stale. If you've got a web socket, bully for you. You can push invalidation messages, and we give you an explicit API to invalidate the cache. Furthermore, sometimes you know what? It's not that big a deal if data is stale over time. We provide you with a time to life expiration. So just like you can do with a web page, you can expire after a certain period of time. So. As we can see, caching works, right? I proved it. Now, another thing you might want to do, though, notice how I mentioned earlier, web applications request large amounts of small resources. Now, we wouldn't want to kick off an HTTP request for every single one of these resources, right? Um, sometimes you might even request a bunch of resources in the same, in the same function. But rather than you having to batch them all up and make one request to Falcor, what if Falcor could batch them for you? So here I am. I'm going to ask for, uh, let's change, let's make it a little more interesting. I'm going to ask for the name of the first title in the first genre list. I'm also going to ask for the rating from the first title in the first genre list, right? Okay, and now obviously we're going to see two HTTP requests, right? Because these are, or sorry, go ahead. You don't. That's how Falcor works. The whole idea, sorry, go ahead. What was that, louder? A singleton, yes, if you want. You can have a singleton model, absolutely. But it, I think it makes sense, less sense to have a singleton model for the reason I'm about to show you, which is that you can create by customizing the way the model behaves. So I'm gonna take this, first I'll run this so we can see that there's two HTTP requests sent off, right? So we have one for the name, one for the rating. Everybody see that, right? But I mean, you know, if we're going around, we're going all the way across the network to download this data, right? I mean, why not just batch these into one network request? Well, rather than me having to sort of, you know, aggregate up all the requests my view is going to need and then put them in one place, which is hard to maintain, inside of my view I can just request data whenever I want it to, whenever I want to, and batch my model. So here I batch the model, and now we have one request. And you guys can't see this, but I'm going to copy it. And this is the path sent off to the server. So it detects the two requests were made within the same tick on the event loop, and it makes one coarse-grained request for us. That's the power of having all your data available at a single URL. You just ask for data whenever you want to in as fine or as coarse-grained quantities as you want to, and Falcor opportunistically batches it up for you. Now, it, yep, question? Well, so that's a good question. Well, now, in some, some network protocols, requests are heavier than in other network protocols. If you got a WebSocket open, meh, right? You got a, you've established a connection, who cares? It's not that expensive. But if you're stuck on HTTP 1.1, then HTTP requests are very expensive. When it comes to HTTP 2, I might not do it as well, because HTTP 2 is very, very cheap to make multiple requests. So when HTTP 2 comes in, I'll probably not turn on batching. But for now, for those of us, I think in a lot of us, are gonna be stuck with HTTP 1 for a long time, I think batching is the right option. Make sense? So anybody can take commands and send them off to the server and have them execute. This is not actually the most powerful optimi optimization that Falcor puts in place. The most powerful optimization that Falcor puts in place I'm going to show you in just a moment. So here I'm going to ask for the name. And this time I'm going to take the exact same thing and we're going to nest it. So instead of doing them at the same time, we're going to do one after the other. Now I showed you how two, sub two sequential requests for the same information would be cached and Falcor could serve that easily out of a cache. I showed you how two concurrent requests for information could be batched into one request. But what can Falcor do about this, where I request one piece of information and then another entirely different piece of information after it? What possible optimization could Falcor put in place? Well, let's see what happens when I make this request. So first I'm going to ask for the name of the first title in the first genre list, House of Cards, and then I'm going to ask for the rating from the first title in the first genre list, hopefully five, right? Let's see what happens. So we got two network requests, as expected, right? Because how wouldn't we? And the first one was in exactly the format we requested. It's pretty much exactly what we asked for. Oops. 
right? So it's just a parse version of the path that we asked for. But what about the second one? We would expect the second one to be genre list zero, titles zero, rating, right? But let's take a look at what it actually is. Oops, it actually is that. <laughs> Sorry, I'll figure out what went wrong here. Got my reference in there. Oh, never mind. Sorry, let me try this locally just for one moment. See if that fixes the problem. Yeah, it should work, actually. <laughs> We don't need the, uh, you know, it should, the bath shouldn't affect anything because these are one, made after, one request made after the other. I'll remove it. Thank you for the help though. See if we can get this working. Do I need to restart my web server? Because I've done that in the past where I didn't restart my web server. Yes. Okay. So now what's actually requested is, let's take a close look at this, what happened? We requested titles by ID 523 rating. Instead of making a request using the path that I entered, Falcor made a request from the server using the ID of the title. It optimized the request to a by ID lookup, which is much faster to evaluate on the server. How did it do it? Well, let's take a look at what the first request returned. The interesting thing is, notice we asked for genre list zero, title zero name. So you might expect that what gets returned is just the name, Die Hard, right, or, or House of Cards, if you will. Here's what actually comes back. Hopefully easier to see. Instead, what gets sent back is every single node, including the reference that's traversed along the way to that particular node. Remember those references we entered as part of our JSON graph? Well, Falcor learns about the structure of your graph when it downloads those references. So whenever we come across a reference while evaluating, what we actually got here is a fragment of the JSON graph document. I'm actually gonna see if we can make that even easier to read. Right, so we actually just got a fragment of the document, all the pieces of the document that we had to traverse in order to get to that. So instead of just returning house of cards, we also got the reference here at genre list zero, title zero. And that means that Falcor has learned something. Falcor's learned that at genre list zero, title zero, we have titles by ID 523. We have a title with an ID of 523. And that means all subsequent requests for that information are gonna optimize automatically and do a lookup by ID. And what does that mean to us developers? No more special APIs that some, where some take pages and some take IDs. You just access this thing like it's an in-memory JSON object and count on the fact that Falcor is gonna optimize it for you if it knows about IDs, right? So, I think I've showed you guys what Falcor is capable of in terms of having the same API and the types of, uh, whether it's on the server or on the client, and the three types of optimizations that it provides, caching, batching, and what we call path optimization. Now the last piece I told you was that Falcor would allow you to take all of your data from all your different data sources, databases, web services, and expose them as a single JSON object. Now all we did was we took a bunch of JSON graph data out of memory and put it into memory on your web server. But I'm guessing most of us out there don't keep our data in memory on our node servers, right? We keep it in databases, SQL Server, MongoDB, right? So how do we make it appear as though our data, which is actually spread across lots of different services, in Netflix's case, over 80 services, how do we make it appear as though that's just one JSON resource out there in the cloud? Well, we use a specialized component called a router. Now, how many people have heard of a router? I'm curious, right? A router is a very simple idea. In fact, we're using one right here. We're using an express router to match this particular request for a URL, and then we run some code and lazily create that data. And so instead of actually having a model.json stored on disk or in memory on our application server, we actually run a bunch of code to generate the data on demand. And that's how our router works. But now in Falcor, we only have one URL, remember? So instead of our router matching paths through URLs, our router matches JavaScript paths. So we actually match the paths through the JSON object that you provide 
and then we allow you to lazily go out and grab that data from the network. So I'm going to show you how the Falcor work router works right now. I'm going to create a router. I think I've got it over here. And we're going to create, actually, we're just going to match the path, a, a path request for the name of a genre list. So if I go back, I think I'm already requesting the name of a genre list, but if not, I'll just change it to that. So I'm, I'll request the name of the first genre list. And right now, this is just going against the in-memory JSON graph object on the server. So let's just run it to make sure it works. Right, recently watched. But now, I'm going to change this code so that we go dynamically to a database and pull that data out of live data in your database without changing the client code at all. So I'm going to hop in here. I'm going to create myself a Falcor router. Got it copied right here. So I'm going to get rid of this model. I don't need it anymore. All it was is a data source for JSON graph data, and I'm replacing that data source with a router, which is also, incidentally, implements the data source interface. So the data source interface is just a simple interface by which you access one layer of interaction between you and JSON graph data. In the case of the router, right, in the case of the model, it was pulling that JSON graph data out of memory. In the case of the router, we match JavaScript path patterns. So here, I'm matching any request for genre list and then some index and then the name, and then I'm running code to actually create that data lazily. So here I'm not actually pulling out of the database. This is just a simple example of me running code to create it on the fly. Yeah, question, question? Sorry, what did you mean by JavaScript path pattern? Ah, so here, this is a JavaScript path, right? Uh, this is exactly what I'm going to be matching with this request right here. Right? So we match any possible JavaScript path you can provide, and then we run code to create the results. And that's how we allow you to store your data wherever you want and keep your node server or application server completely stateless. So if I run this, hopefully it works. And we get recently watched, but this time it's because we returned what we call a path value, which is just basically this little pair of path, the path requested, and then the value for that path. And all those path values get put together into one big JSON graph object and then sent over the wire as a result. Oh, you know what? I might not have busted. Hopefully when I restart the server, it'll still work. Oh, no. It's terrible. All right. Well, this is why you don't copy and paste code. Model's not defined. I probably have a reference to model in here somewhere. And I do. And that's because before, I was returning my model as a data source. And now I've replaced that data source as a router. Great. OK. Thanks for keeping me honest. So as you can see here, I don't have time in the rest of this presentation to show you, but of course, since this is just code, you can go off and request data from Mongo. You can go and get your data from a SQL server. You can go and get this data from wherever you want. As you can see, we're programmatically running a function which generates the portion of the JSON graph object requested by the client. And so you can put whatever code you want in here, because in the end, what we're returning, in this particular case, we're returning just an array, but you can actually return a promise. And so that gives you the opportunity to make asynchronous calls. Yeah? It is, well, if you request the first and second, let's find out. Um, it's, so the question was, um, if you request the first and second object, right, what, what's going to happen? Are, are the question, is it going to make multiple network calls or multiple re requests to the server? The zeroth one will come out of the cache, and the, the first one will be requested from the server. Make sense? So you ask for two objects. If you, first, you ask for, for the first index in a list. And the next time around, you ask for the first and second index in a list. The first one will be served from cache, and only the piece that's not in cache will be requested from the server. So I'm going to make a quick change here. And instead of just asking for zero, I'm going to ask for zero to one. And we'll see that what happens is a route can actually match multiple requests. Oops. Oh, I use get value when I'm asking for multiple values. Don't do that. 
So we got new, recently watched and new releases, but the key thing to understand here is that this, both of those requests match this route and we have this one function called to request the data for both. So that's why here you see integers, right? We can actually match, or indices, excuse me. We can actually match multiple requests for JavaScript paths in a single route. Because unlike a route, a regular router, an HTTP router, which only matches, has to match one URL, URL at a time, we've already seen that in Falcor you can make multiple JavaScript path requests in a single request. And rather than have each one of those trigger some data, back end request to your database, you can actually match a set of paths using a pattern. And so what you'll see here, if I go, if I restart the web server, we should see only one request for both those pieces of information. Now if I go take a look at the logs, right, just one request, even though I've asked for two separate JavaScript paths. What was that, sorry? Oh yeah. Tell them the truth. Okay, I'm, I'm down to four minutes, so let me just get through. I think I'm pretty much done. So I showed you guys what building a routed model looks like, right? So you can go to any of these different services. In fact, this is really how Netflix works. Your data is spread across multiple databases, and then we request it all. Just sorry, I'll get to you in just one moment. And so Falcor on the server means the caching benefits of REST, low latency, and small message sizes of RPC. And it also supports function calls, which I don't have a chance to get into today. If you need transactionality, we support RPC style function calls as well. And so this is sort of how it works in Netflix. If, I, if you make a request to show a detail, you can create a show detail controller, and it accesses data through the asynchronous Falcor model. But what it can also do, and I didn't get a chance to show you, is you can create another model that's bound to a location inside of the JSON graph. So that creates this other model that's bound to this specific location, and that this is for a particular title. Now this model is bound to this one particular title. And now our detailed view just makes requests, and in, in some frameworks, like Angular 2, for example, you can actually support async binding right there in line in your template. So you can actually bind directly from your view to Falcor's async model. And so we're making three requests for data here, but they all get batched up using the batch. We send off a single request to the server, and then if we already have the references in cache, those will get optimized into request by ID. We send down just the data required, which gets delivered to the view, and it outputs HTML. So today, Falcor powers every single Netflix UI that was built in the last three years, except for our legacy UIs. Falcor is powering each one of these UIs. Falcor is also available right now. It's open source. You can go check it out. Um, and if you're looking for more information, um, you can check out Falcor.js. I don't think I, I think I might have taken out my intro slide. My name is Joffrey Hussain. Uh, I'm the architect of Falcor, and uh, I'm a, a technical lead at Netflix. Uh, and uh, finally, you can also follow our illustrious lead developer, Michael Paulson, who's done some amazing work on Falcor. Uh, check him out on Twitter. I'm all done. <laughs> Question there in the front. Great, great question. So one of the questions was, what's the cache size? Well, the good news is you can set it to whatever you want. And that's how Netflix takes the same app and scales it down to work on some very, very inexpensive DVD player, as well as the next generation console. You can basically scale up the cache size or down the, down the cache size based on the amount of available memory you have. And to make sure that we only purge the stuff that's least likely to be used, we keep what we call an LRU cache. So we, we cache everything and organize it by the least recently used item. And so when we purge, we purge the stuff that you haven't used in a while. Let's see your next question. Uh, so second question would be, how does it optimize for process caching? Because you are caching in memory. So that's yep. like the second time the user coming back to this page and here is no cache. We don't browser cache because browser caching would be too coarse grain for us, right? If I browser cache when you pass some arbitrary set of paths, right, now we have that problem I pointed out with RPC earlier, which is that you can have multiple resources that store the same data. And so we basically turn off caching at the browser level, and we get it at the memory level. The last question? I noticed that the protocol uses using get requests. Yep. So is there a limit on the number of requests? You can switch to post if you outlive the size for a get, yeah. Oh yeah, we've got plugins for, so uh, uh, Netflix actually uses Restify, which is a really great uh, web server. We've got plugins available for Express, uh, Restify, Happy if you use it. Um, so I think most of the, the web servers out there are covered, and even the community uses Koa, I believe. Somebody's contributed a Koa one as well, yeah?
right? Here's how I do pagination right here. Sorry, it looks like my time's up, guys, and I was told there was a hard stop, but I will take questions just off the side. Or do we, do we have to get out of the building, or can we stay in here? I'll take questions off to the side. If you want to keep asking questions, I'll, I'll definitely try my best to answer everybody's questions. Okay.